So today we are in our second power of the 12 powers. Last week we were in faith, bringing up that foundation, that first power that calls the rest of the 11. And so what is this 12 powers teaching? It's all about the realization of the Christ consciousness. So if you imagine the I am, the Christ consciousness, the divine consciousness to be the sort of super soul that is above the crown, that's what we're, we're lifting up to. That's what we're aiming toward. That's what the whole being is being brought to. By looking at each of these 12 powers, which became a, t a key teaching of unity, um, Charles Fillmore, our co-founder, took the early teachings from the 12 jewels of mysticism from his teacher, Emma Curtis Hopkins, and, and turned it into the 12 powers of humankind. And so those 12 powers that we're looking at, it's a way of taking each of these aspects of our divinity, each of these abilities, if you will, and to take a look at them and kind of move them around, look at the different facets of them, include both the, the body the, and the mind and the spirit and the emotional being, because it's always a holistic walk, isn't it, to ignite these act and activate these areas that make the wholeness of who we are. And so the power of strength is located, as I mentioned in the meditation, in the small back, in the low back. How many of you have ever noticed how amazing your back is? And particularly we notice this when it's hurting, right? <laughs> Anybody ever had low back pain? Yeah, right? And then you go, wow, I use my back for everything. I use it for walking and for sitting and for moving and for you know, working, even if you're doing computer work. You know, there's just a constant use of the back, right? So that, that location reminds us from a physical level how key this power is, how important it is to ground ourselves in strength. So you also know all these 12 powers have reflections in biblical characters. The 12 disciples are lined up with the 12 powers. Throughout the series, I'll occasionally bring in Letty Hammock's work, which added the women of the chalice, the, some of the biblical uh, women of the, of the, um, that correspond with each of the powers. And Andrew is the second disciple who was called who represents strength. His name means strong man. And so he was the brother of Peter, who is, is faith. And so these two powers are closely related. Many of the powers have this sort of relationship with one another that bolster each other. So if you think about faith, faith is that, that power that we know that anything is possible, right? Faith is that foundational power that we stand on, the beginning, the first one called in the middle of the head is where faith is located, the color of royal blue. And now its brother is called forth, strength. This place in the low back, this place of light green is the color. It's the color of, of aliveness. It's the color of growth. It's the spring green. And so this is connected, the two, strength. What is strength? Strength is, is endurance, right? Strength is tenacity. Strength is perseverance. Strength is, is standing in our spiritual truth. But strength is not rigidity. Strength is also flexibility. Strength is also an ability to move, right? When we strengthen our low backs, one of the ways we do that maybe is through core exercises or, or exercises for the back. But it's not just about that, right? Because, you know, you can build muscles and be super stiff, right? You can be like the guy who walks around like this, you know? It's like things don't look very flexible. And yet, if we do stretching and yoga and chiropractic and massage, we get the space opened up, right? It's, it's open. And that's what we want in our spiritual work, right? Open space for spirit to move and have its being in us. So this power is, a, and they're all key powers, but it's, it's worth, and, and my intention and hope is that each week as I introduce a power, that you work with a power throughout the week. Include, you know, the color, bring the color, this, you know, similar to this color green or any kind of light green, into your, your field of vision. You know, work with color if you, if you like to work with art or journal on the power and, and start to look at the different ways that you show up grounded fully in this power. Really allow, affirm this power throughout the week. You know, different ways that you can work with it. And then each one, as we ignite and activate each one, they begin to work together for the whole, to lift up the whole being, to lift up the wholeness of who we are and to embody the wholeness of our divine selves as this Christed being, this anointed one. Because that's what you are. Do you know that? Do you know that truth? 
Sometimes it's hard for us to take that truth in, isn't it? And resistance can be a great block to strength. So breaking down our resistance can be a great way that we open the way to the fullness of the power of strength. There's a great biblical story of David and Goliath. Anybody remember that story? Some of you are nodding your heads or, yeah. So in David and Goliath, there, there's, there's a great battle going on, right, between the Israelites and the Philistines. And little David is just a boy, and so he can't be in the battle, but he really wants to be in the battle. So what he does is he runs supplies to his Israelite brothers, but he can't be one of the warriors in the battle. But he keeps hearing the taunts of the giant Goliath, the great warrior from the Philistines, who they go in great detail about the, the cubic feet of his you know, uh, armor and his iron and his size. I mean, just imagine the largest giant you can fully armored with spears and swords and whatnot. You know, a, a pretty, you know, imposing figure, if you will. <laughs> and so David hears these taunts and none of the Israelites want to accept the, the, what he's saying, which is, send me one of your Israelites and we'll have a one-on-one -on -one battle. I'm the greatest warrior of the Philistines. Send me your greatest warrior from the Israelites and let's have this out, just one-on-one -on -one and take care of it, right? But none of the Israelites want to do that, right? But little David, the little boy, he hears this and it's, he doesn't just hear it, but he hears it as a call within him, a spiritual call that says, I'm the one. And so he's going tugging on, on King Saul saying, you know, let me be the one to fight the Goliath, the, the Philistine warrior. And Saul's like, you gotta be kidding me, you're a boy. I, I, I can't send you out, and you know, King Saul's known for his wisdom, right? He can't, can't send, uh, send him out into the battle. And so, the, but the boy persists over and over again. David asks and asks and says, send me in. I can do this, I can do this. So finally Saul goes, okay. You know, take my armor. So he puts his own armor on this boy and it's just like falling off of him, right? So he just finally just takes the armor off. And plain clothed, he goes into the arena with his hunting slingshot and five smooth stones. And there's the Goliath, right? Facing him with all the armor and the swords and the spears and whatnot. And David says to him, this battle is the Lord's battle. And today, everyone in the assembly will watch as the Lord delivers you into my hand. And it wasn't done in a cocky way, but in a, in a, in a faithful way of knowing. I'm called to be here. I'm unafraid. I'm standing in my strength. I've got my little tools here. We'll see how that goes. Yeah. <laughs> And as soon as he has made this great statement of power and truth, he takes the first stone and he slings it at Goliath and it just happens to get through the space of armor in the right place and Goliath tumbles with just that first stone. So what does this mean for us? Well, what is your Goliath? <laughs> is there some disease you're dealing with or financial hardship, relationship hardship? Is there something in your life that feels like a Goliath? And it doesn't have to feel like a giant, but something you're facing down. And there's a call within you that says, you can do this. You have the strength within you. You have the power within you to face this Goliath, whatever it is. Is there a knowing in you or maybe a dance going on inside of you that says, I think I can, <laughs> I'm not sure, I want to, I want to you know, be able to stand tall in this, I want to be able to face down this seeming monster, whatever it is. And so it's a listening, a listening to that call, to that knowing that yes, you do have the perseverance. Yes, you do have the focus needed. Yes, you do have the call of spirit, the reminder that you have all the strength you could ever need to move through whatever this obstacle is, the seeming obstacle before you, to meet it, to, and to meet it with that kind of knowing that anything is possible. This is the, the twin nature of these two powers that faith and strength work together. There's a knowing that anything is possible. There's a standing in that strength. So whatever that is, it's also a kind of flexibility that's brought forth for you. It's not just a standing in your, in your truth and a grounding in that and a focus and an endurance kind of sense of I will see this through to the end. 
But there's also a kind of flexibility, like the image of the tree that stands tall and is deeply rooted in the earth, deeply rooted in spirit. You think of the redwoods, they stand so tall and proud and confident and big, and it seems like nothing could ever bowl them over. But did you ever notice when the winds blow hard, they don't just stand static, but their branches and their leaves, they sway, their needles fall? Yeah, so that is kind of what we need to be when we are in our power of strength. That we also need to be flexible. We also need to be able to move with what comes our way. We also need to have a sense of openness. And that's the, the call to bring forward the warrior. In you. Linda Martella Witsit is one of the authors of the many 12 Powers books that are um, out there that have been written over the years. She's written one of the more recent ones called D Divine Audacity. And in it, she talks about strength, saying that the successful application of strength allows for a firm resolve of the truth that we know, as well as the flexibility to respond to situations as they occur moment to moment. So there is that kind of resolve, but there's also that kind of sway, right? So that whatever comes my way, I'm also open. I'm also listening. I'm also listening to the spirit within me, to the person before me. I'm listening with my heart. I'm listening with the wisdom within me. I'm calling forth on other powers that I might partner with in the full opening of my strength, the full activation of my power of strength. You know, we had a lock in the back of this building, Charlene can tell you, that wasn't working. And we thought, oh, we might have to call the locksmith. We might have to replace the lock. And then, you know, somebody comes along with a magic little lubricant, puts it in the lock, and suddenly we've got movement, right? What was rigid and seemed broken is suddenly, you know, moving with ease. In 1953, there was a little startup company that was working on coming up with a, a rust lubricant that would help the aerospace industry. And they kept trying to, to find how to make this thing work. And so they tried once, and then they tried 10 times, and you know, 10 different things that didn't work, and 20. And then they tried 30 times, and 39 times. And on the 40th try, the magic, magic formula came together. And, and that product, you might know, you might even have it, sitting on a shelf at home is called WD-40. <laughs> and it stands for water displacement perfected on the 40th try. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Yeah. So it is that kind of perseverance, it is that kind of focus, but you know, that required flexibility, that required getting information, getting feedback, putting that feedback to work, trying something new. It requires flexibility. Yeah, we could say I'm really determined and give it a try and it doesn't work and we go, I'm on to something else. <laughs> but the power of strength, if it's still calling us, then, then it, there's a call to continue to be with it, to open to it, to look at possibilities, to be flexible and open, yet strong in our resolve that the ultimate outcome we want is that which we are aiming for. The ultimate outcome is the overcoming of fear. For David, it was an overcoming, right? An overcoming of the fear that his Israelite brothers were holding. It's an overcoming of that to say, ha, are you kidding me? I'm with God, I don't need anything else. I'm standing fully embodied in the spirit that I am. And when I'm standing from that place of my faith and my strength, nothing can bowl me over, right? And that's the kind of strength that we're called into. Years ago, there was a young boy, his name happened to be Andrew, which means strong man, I'll remind you again. And Andrew and his father were the only ones in their family and they were really, really close. His father supported him through anything he wanted to do and he loved sports, but he was a little guy and he didn't often get put in the game. And he loved football in particular. And so as he got into high school, his father said, you know, if you don't want to play football, it's okay. You may not get to play very much if you get on the team. He said, that's okay, Dad. I love football. So he tried out, and he made the team. And he came to every practice, and he gave it his all, and he went to every game, and he warmed the bench every game through all of his high school. <laughs> 
And his father came to every single game without fail, always giving him words of encouragement before the game, words of encouragement after the game, words of encouragement throughout the season. When he came to the time of going to college, he tried out as a walk-on for the football team. And the only reason the coach admitted to his father that he let him on is because this kid played with his whole heart and his whole soul. And, and he said that inspires the rest of the team. So even if he doesn't get a, got a lot of play time, he's offering something my team needs. And so then the father was sent season tickets and he came to every game, same thing, you know, encouraging the kid before, encouraging Andrew after the games, but he never saw the playing field on a game. Until it was a senior year and one day it was practice during the playoffs and a telegram was, was delivered and he stood on the field watching or reading it and his shoulders began to drop and his head began to droop as he read that his father had passed. And he said, hey coach, can I have the day off? And the coach said, hey, you take as long as time as you need, miss practice all week, you don't even have to come to the game on Saturday, which is a playoff game. Andrew showed up in the third quarter. He went ahead and suited up, went out to the, to the um, team, stood by his coach and said, hey coach, put me in. It was a playoff game. It was really important that they win that game. The coach ignored him. <laughs> He hoped he would, could just act like he didn't hear him because he didn't want to put this kid in. He was a little kid. But he, like David, sort of tugging on the coattails of the king, kept saying, coach, really, put me in, put me in. And so finally the coach did, and he did everything right. He blocked every block that was possible. He tackled with perfection. He was just on it all across the field. In the last seconds of the game, Andrew intercepted the ball and ran all the way down for the scoring touchdown. And he's sitting, he's sitting, <laughs> he's sitting in the locker room afterwards. Everybody has gone, showered and so on, and he's just kind of sitting there quiet in his space. And his coach comes along and says, Andrew, amazing. Your game was amazing. How did you do that? How did you, where did that come from? And he said, well, you know how my dad came to all the games? And he said, yeah. He goes, and he was always my encourager and my cheerleader and my supporter. He goes, what a lot of people didn't know is my dad is legally blind. He couldn't have seen me play. But today, he could see me play. <laughs> and I wanted more than anything for him to see me do well. And so that is the kind of strength that includes our whole being, right? That includes the wholeness of who we are to stay strong and persevering, but open, soft and supple as well. The Tao Te Ching has something to say about that. The Tao Te Ching says, the soft and the supple are the companions of life, while the rigid, the stiff, the unyielding are the companions of death. And so the aliveness, the green of the strength, is the softness and the suppleness that is within what we see in the outer when we think of strength. It's the key, really. It's the key ingredient in our strength, is the openness, the vulnerability, the softness, the flexibility. That's what makes it all work together for greater good. That's what brings the fullness of this power to the fore. Winifred Wilkinson Hausman is another uh, 12 Powers author. She wrote Your God-Given Potential. And in it, she talks about the, this same idea, but what is it that, that causes us to be the opposite of the softness and the supple? What causes us to choose the companions of death that are rigid, stiff, unyielding. She said, when we are in those kinds of spaces, we're like ramming our opinions forward, you know? Or we're not really hearing other people's opinions. We're in that kind of place where we're, we need to be right versus, you know, doing it together in a way that is for the greater good. And so it's that kind of openness that is required 
for the power of strength to open to its fullness. She says we resist also when we worry. We resist when we're, in, when we're flaring up in our temper. When we are in those resistant spaces, we are not in a place of strength. Strength is non-resistant. Counterintuitive maybe, but true, right? How many non-resistant movements have we seen that have been wildly successful? Little Gandhi, who overtook the entire British Empire and gained India's independence through a movement that he started that was non-violent and non-resistant. There were no weapons on his being. He didn't come with a spear and a javelin and a sword and a semi-automatic weapon. He came with the power of the strength of spirit within him to do the right thing for the greater good of the people and won. And it always wins in the end. The civil rights movement is still going on in many ways, but we can look to Martin Luther King, to Selma, to the peaceful protests that happen all around the world, to Black Lives Matter, and see that that strength is still there, that perseverance is still there, that endurance is still there. And yet it has to be flexible and open and patient, infinitely patient, right? In order for the good to come forth. And so if we're ramming ahead without patience, with, with a sense of it's got to happen now, sometimes we're really not in the power of strength, although that may seem strong <laughs> in the ways that we define it in the world. It's not spiritual strength, and it's certainly not spiritual wisdom. And so it is this kind of being, this kind of knowing, this kind of rootedness, and all these different sort of flavors of strength that brings in the fullness of the power for us that brings in the greatness of what we are meant to be because we really take the faith, the knowing of faith in our hearts and we act in strength. Strength is a real active kind of, mo it can be a very active power for us, how we show up in the world. The father of fathers right now in the world, the Pope himself has been demonstrating this kind of strength. Have you been tuned in to the Chilean, the, the, you know, we, know, we all know about the thousand year, thousands of years of abuse that, that kids have suffered at the hands of, of the Catholic Church that has been covered up and so on. And at first, um, Pope Francis didn't take in what was the, the accusations that were happening in Chile. And he dismissed some of it in January. And, and then the people, metaphysically, whenever the people are the feelings and thoughts, but also the people, right? There's something inside of us that goes, huh, I missed something here, you know, and something outside of us that said, oh yeah, you missed something here, <laughs> right? And, and so it, recently, he has done extraordinary things to move toward healing this thousands of year old issue. So the, the, um, the bishops have been invited from the Chilean bishops have been invited to the Vatican and they have talked about it. Some of them he's asked to resign. And he has publicly apologized for having dismissed the accusations and having dismissed some of the things the victims were saying. He said, I didn't have all the information, I am sorry. And, and he's invited the, the highest level or the most... Um, the, the highest profile victims of abuse, these now men who were young boys at the time of the abuse, to come personally to the Vatican. Juan Carlos Cruz is one of them who was interviewed on Morning Edition on NPR, and he talked about his meeting with the Pope, and he thought, you know, at the most, maybe I'll get, you know, 20 minutes, that would be a lot to ask, right, of the Pope's time to just share and to be with him as he's inviting me for forgiveness. I mean, he's invited the victim, the Chilean victims, these three men, to, to, so that the Vatican can offer forgiveness, so that the Pope himself can offer forgiveness. And it's the first thing he said when Juan Carlos came and sat down with him, uh, that, that Juan Carlos reported in this interview, that I apologize. On the behalf of the office of the Pope, on behalf of the universal church, I apologize for what happened to you. You know how, how amazing that is? I mean, it's like taking this monolithic structure that has protected power at these high levels and turning it into a house of cards that we can now see the truth and the strength of the people coming forward. And to honor those victims who, can you imagine how hard it was 
especially in a macho culture, to come forward these young men and to say what had happened to them and to be vulnerable and to even allow themselves to be seen as a victim. You know, huge amount of courage and strength. And that the Pope himself is willing to entertain a different conversation now. He didn't spend 20 minutes with Juan Carlos. He spent hours with him one day, a couple hours the next day, another hour the next day, because the listening wasn't done. The forgiveness wasn't done. The empathy and the compassion wasn't complete. That's what strength is. It's a, it's a kind of, yes, it's powerful and it's standing in spiritual truth and it's standing on the sort of moral platitudes of what we know is right, but it's also this kind of open humility, humbleness, compassion, listening, flexibility. This is what gives us the strength of back, right? This is what allows us the open spaces to move about the world and the spiritual strength that we're called to be. And so these things are happening on the collective level that are teachers for us constantly, just like we would look at a biblical story and we would metaphysically interpret it. I encourage you to look at what's happening in the world and metaphysically interpret it. Bring it down to the level of your personal experiences. What is, what is tumbling around me that needs to go, power structures that need to go, my own resistance, my own places where I am stubborn, my own places where I get dug in, my own places that I am limiting the power of strength. You know, when we lift something heavy, what do we do? What do we tell each other? Bend your knees, right? Bend your knees so the full weight of that thing can be taken up by the full body, by the, the full power of your strength. And don't do it yourself, right? Ask somebody else to help you. The old way of, you know, I am the pioneer doing everything by myself is beginning to fall away because we're recognizing that collaboration and teamwork and, and lifting up together is the key to our success. And so we have the highest, you could say in some ways, the highest spiritual leader, one of the highest spiritual leaders in the world sitting with individual victims of abuse and having dialogue. The times are so alive with the power of spirit opening up for all of us. So to take that in, to see that in the world, to look for the places where it's happening in good ways, I mean, I know some of you don't like what's happening in this country, and I don't always like it either. But I tell you, we have the right president at the right time. Things are happening and opening up and spilling over in ways that maybe it never would have otherwise. It's bizarre in some ways, and it's fabulous in other ways. And so let's look to the fabulous. Let's look to the good. This is what strength does for us. Strength never asks what is missing. That is a question that will take you in the wrong direction. Strength asks, what do we do that's good? What, what is, is solid here? What is solid within me? What is solid in my relationship? And we build from there. That is strength. The other way will take us down, down, down into the dissolution of strength and power. So look to what is good. Look to what is working in the world, in your life, in your relationship. Call it out. Appreciate it. Call it up. This will strengthen whatever it is you're up to in the world, in your communities, in your work, in our community. We call forth the strength that we have to look around us. You know, I, I want to tell you, too, that we had um, Martha Creek here recently, who is a pretty well-known in the New Thought movement, a uh, teacher of teachers. She's a, uh, sh her, her mission is to serve those who serve. And she worked with our board and staff, and I hope next year I'll bring her back to work with everyone. But she, um, Martha said, asked the board and staff to list key, key people in our congregation. And she was, like, had her mouth dropped open afterwards. And she said to me, in 20 years of working with churches, I have never heard so many people named. And that is thanks to you. Because you are the power of this congregation. We are the community. This is it, folks. <laughs> we are the ones who get to decide where we go next. We are the ones who get to decide if we go 
or we go whoop. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We're at that point. We're at that point. It's a pivotal time in our history. It really is. It's a pivotal time for us to call up the power of faith and twin power it with a power of strength and say, this is who we are as a community and this is where we're going as a community and I stand in that place of flexibility and perseverance at the same time. That's what makes us who we are. How fabulous to hear from the outside that never has she heard such a community Never has she known such a place that has so many what she calls points of power in the congregation. So thank you for being Unity of Walnut Creek's point of power. The anchors, those who are holding up the strength of this place and will go forward from here as we call upon the strength in the best way that we possibly can. As we foundation, as we create that foundation and sit upon that foundation of faith and act from that place in our strength. And so in your own life, life, as you make change in your own life, as you raise up your consciousness in your own life, you can't help but affect the goodness of unity of Walnut Creek because you are joined here. You cannot help but raise up the greater good of whatever organizations you're connected to in your work or your service. You can't help but affect your family and your individual relationships because you are walking the path of David, little David, who faced the Goliath with no fear. You are walking the path of Gandhi, small Gandhi, who started an entire movement out of non-resistance and non-violence. You are walking in the footsteps of Martin Luther King, who sees what's not working in the world and stands in a place of strength. You are the one, we are the ones, we are the ones, you know? We are the ones we've been waiting for. Ever hear that one? This is it, folks. <laughs> and thank God that some of the leaders will awaken when they awaken and they will bring what they bring. But we're in a time when some things need to kind of blow up and fall away. It's true. And that's a hard place to be sometimes. But don't let it get you down. Let it be the opening, the way in, the opening up, the possibility, the lifting up. This is who we've come to be, right? Tapped into spirit, tuned in to the power of strength and turned on by the possibilities and the ability and the expression of strength and what it will bring into our lives. We are strong beyond measure, beyond what we think is, oh, just little old me. <laughs> Nobody stood in that place and developed and activated the full power of their strength, and neither will we, right? So let's know this truth that we are strong beyond measure together. I invite you to say this affirmation with all that you have. Maybe take a moment to breathe in, to bring your energy to the small of your back, this area where the strength lives, to activate this power, to see in light green. And then together, let's affirm together, I am strong beyond measure. Together, I am strong beyond measure. So it is. <laughs> <laughs>